guest today on the Science Studio is Sam Harris, author of the New York Times bestseller, The End of Faith and Letter to a Christian Nation, and co-founder and director of the Reason Project. He's also completing a doctorate in neuroscience at the University of California, Los Angeles. Sam, welcome. Thank you, Roger. Um, Sam is here um, for the third annual Beyond Belief meeting. You were here for the first one and the second. Mm. Um, We've gone through a lot of territory in those two meetings, but I'm thinking of this, this larger sweep, going back to the end of faith. You said in the book that you started writing it on 9 12, 2001, right. the day after um, the attacks. And from there to almost the current issue of Newsweek, um, perhaps last week's Newsweek, where you're impaling, impaling, um, that's quite a sweep. Uh, did you expect to be traversing that kind of territory when you sat down to do this book? Uh, you know, I definitely didn't. I, you know, there was no way to really visualize the outcome of writing the book. In fact, I started writing it before I knew it was going to be published as a book. I just couldn't do otherwise. I mean, the moment I felt that we were meandering into a, a essentially a religious war without calling it such, uh, I started writing that book and. Um, yeah, I had no expectation, frankly. I, you know, I just thought it was going to slide off the printer's press and into oblivion. I mean, at each stage of its reception, I was surprised by the, the, the kind of conversation it was inspiring. But where were you on 9-11? In Los Angeles. So watching this on yeah. television. Yeah. And, I mean, not everybody suddenly rushes to do this. I mean, Don DeLillo eventually sits down and decides to write a novel called Falling Man, but that's years later. I mean, right. what, what well, was going on? Uh, well, I was doing my PhD in neuroscience, and uh, essentially the end of faith was what happened, uh, was the, the collision of my intellectual career at that point with the events of 9-11. I was, I was kind of strangely placed to respond to it because I had been studying religion on my own for, for uh, the better part of 15 years. And then uh, uh, my interest in, in consciousness and in uh, altered states of consciousness and religious experience brought me in to, uh, to finish my degree in philosophy. And I was going to do a PhD in philosophy and at the last minute decided, well, I, I really want to know more about the brain. Uh, so I was two years into a, to my, my, dis, my um, uh, coursework at, at UCLA in neuroscience. And so I was someone who was spending a lot of time thinking about religion and religious experience. Uh, someone who was thinking about the difference between scientific objectivity and all of the uh, absurdity and fallacious reasoning that we see in the name of religion. Um, and then people start flying planes into our buildings, obviously, based on what they believe to be true about the nature of the universe, based on, on uh, uh, um, no evidence uh, that anyone should, should credit. And we, on our own side, based on our own attachment to religious mythology, uh, couldn't find any other way to console ourselves but to invoke our own religious myths, uh, and couldn't really call a spade a spade uh, with respect to Islam and articulate what the problem was. The problem is uh, that a majority of human beings believe the unbelievable uh, and really believe it, really are motivated to, to uh, live by the light of Iron Age philosophy. Uh, so uh, I just thought, found myself just well positioned to respond because I you know, had been reading the literature for long enough. I knew what Islam was and I didn't have to get up to speed the way most people did in this country. Um, uh, and so, and I, and I also knew that, that most of what people think they're getting out of religion, and certainly the, the, the best and most esoteric things like altered states of consciousness and unconditional love and, and uh, uh, some of the rarefied uh, uh, psychology that you get from, from the best of religious literature, that can be had without presupposing anything on insufficient evidence. You don't have to believe things on faith in order to go into the laboratory of your own life and see what the consequences are of using your attention in different ways. Uh, and having done, you know, spent at least a decade doing that but before 9-11, studying meditation and, and, and uh, 
I had a, a psychedelic phase. I mean, I knew it was possible to perturb the nervous system in ways that some of which are normative. You know, some, it's possible, possible to be a psychotic, but it's possible to, to change your your moment-to-moment -moment perception of your life in ways that really uh, lie at the heart of religious experience or, or ostensibly at the heart of religious experience. But you don't have to believe anything on faith in order to look into that. And that's the, the real perversity of uh, religion in, in probably any age, but certainly in our current age, the, the fact that most of its subscribers, most of the people who want to become like Jesus, think they have to believe the preposterous in order to be a part of that, that uh, journey. We'll come back to that in a minute. But let, let's just gloss that a little bit more. You had been reading this on religion for 15 years. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, because I'd had certain experiences in my teens and early 20s that, for which religious thinking seemed to be the only context. I mean, religion and more Eastern philosophy than mystical than experiences. Of yeah. Some kind. What, what yeah. would be called mystical experiences? Yeah. Of yeah. what nature? Well, both through meditation and through my first experiences with psychedelics, uh, you know, probably at age 19. Uh, I mean, the, fir the, the very first experience was with, with MDMA, which is right. ecstasy, which is now uh, this very popular you know, club drug. But you know, when I took it back in 86, I think it was, it was not, you know, it hadn't, hadn't been discovered by by the culture in that way, and it was either there were certain people using it in, in research, and um, uh, it was just it was an incredibly simple uh, experience in the context in which I took it. It was just uh, feeling so much neurosis drop away in a way that you never thought was possible. Uh, it was just a, just a a, uh, a sense of being much more uh, nakedly aware of your experience than you have ever been. And uh, many of the things that you've always been trying to get rid of without knowing you want to get rid of them, like anxiety and fear and judgment and uh, apprehension about the future, all of that was just dropped away. And it was, it was, uh, it suggested that there really was a path, whatever it is, whether it's pharmacological or attentional or uh, through happenstance or whether you just have to have good genes or that, whatever it is, there's a, a difference between how I was tending to feel and how it was possible to feel. And religion really has been the only game in town when, you, when it comes time to talk about that. I mean, in, the we in Western philosophy, you don't have to be wise to be a great philosopher. In, a, in Eastern philosophy, it, it's still, there still is a, a, a eudaimonic basis to, to uh, uh, having credibility. In, mm -hmm. in, so the great, the great philosophers of the East, you know, whatever we may think of, of their philosophy when they talk about epistemology and, and uh, other nitty-gritty uh, facts, uh, at the very least they had uh, uh, at least advertised a kind of wisdom of living. I mean, they had transcended their ordinary neuroses to some significant degree, and their philosophy was about that possibility. In the West, I mean, you can have a, a Wittgenstein or you know some, somebody who's clearly brilliant, clearly doing interesting work that we call philosophy, but there's no burden upon him to be anything other than a, a florid neurotic. Uh, and so, you know, so lo looking into Western philosophy for w the wisdom that will transform a human life, um, you really have to pick and choose and, and, and pick and choose so acrobatically that it's, it's, it's a bit of a fool's errand. Uh, but hopefully that, that will change. I think that should change. Uh, and, there, and there are thinkers who, who, who have pointed that out and you know, Owen Planigan I know is, is coming to this conference. Mm -hmm. He's someone who's, who I think has, has also made noises of this sort. Um, uh, there's got to be, I think there's got to be a marriage between uh, thinking clearly about the human circumstance and actually liberating unnecessary human suffering, actually liberating the kinds of confusion that uh, causes so many of us to waste our lives. So that, that I think it's written, uh, this is public knowledge, that you, that you 
as far as Buddhist principles, right? Lots yeah, w w without you. Yeah. I read somewhere that you were a bodyguard for the Dalai Lama or something. Like well, that. for a month. I was, oh, a month. Yeah. A month. Just, a, just, a, just a fun way to hang out with the Dalai Lama. As it oh. turns out, he had, he had real bodyguards happily. Um, but uh, although, ironically, that the the fake bodyguards got into much more conflict with the world because the real body, the bodyguards just stood behind us and pushed us out into the barricades. Um, so, uh, but I, I don't call myself a Buddhist. I've studied with many Buddhist meditation masters in, in uh, India, Nepal, and uh, uh, elsewhere, but mostly Burmese and Tibetan uh, uh, teachers of meditation. But, you know, I, I wrote an article in, and published it in, in the Shambhala Sun, which is the, one of the more well-read Buddhist magazines called Killing the Buddha, and there I talked about how how the wisdom of, of the Buddha is really buried in the, and obscured by the religion of Buddhism. I mean, if you're, if you're fond of what the Buddha taught, you have to get out of the religion business. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not at all interested in the perpetuation of Buddhism as a religion. Uh, I, I mean, I think the Buddha has to be looked at like uh, any great thinker. Um, and uh, we use what's useful out of his corpus and we throw away the rest and in the same way we use what's useful in Einstein's work and throw away the rest. Uh, so. so when you talk about getting out of the religion business, I mean, were you ever in the religion business? What's the family background here? I mean, End of Faith was dedicated to your mother. I don't know what your parents, was there any religious background there, no. any science background? What was the story there? Actually, neither. Uh, it, was, it was a totally secular upbringing. My mother is Jewish. And uh, my father, who, who died uh, about 20 years ago, um, was Quaker, but there was no, uh, I mean, he also left early. So I, I basically grew up uh, uh, with, a, with, with my mother, so uh, with a single parent. And there was no religious indoctrination that I was, that I'm reacting against. Um, I was always just encouraged to, I wasn't di discouraged. I mean, she was not an identified atheist either, but. There was just there was no God talk in the house. All right, so so there's st still a little confused. There's still something that happens on 9/11 that yeah. that that um, produces. Um, you are now known as the one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Okay, there's you, there's Hitchens, right. there's Dan Dennett, and there's Richard Dawkins. Um, you've also been dubbed the new atheists. Um, there's a huge amount of attention being attracted to that. It's it's a very, um, in some some ways, very forceful, in your face kind of movement that's right. produced a, a, a b quite a, quite a pushback as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the the technique that uh, you you decided was the best way to go with this, right? Well, I actually never used the word atheist in the end of faith, and I never thought to not use it. I, I simply didn't think of myself as an atheist. Uh, I didn't use the word. I mean, I, in the same way that I don't think of myself as a non-astrologer. You know, I don't. No one has to wake up in the morning and repudiate <coughs> astrologer uh, astrology by accepting the identity as a non-astrologer. Uh, and th there's no one who, who you know, n virtually no one believes in Zeus, and we haven't defined ourselves in opposition to paganism. We're not non-pagans. Um, and I think it's also useful to point out that every devout Christian stands in the same relationship to Hinduism or to, to Islam as I do. I mean, the Christians look at what's going on in, in Muslim discourse. They look at the claim that the Quran is the perfect word of the creator of the universe, and they are not persuaded. And that's all, that's all my atheism consists of. I'm, I'm not persuaded by the, these patently ridiculous claims. And I am persuaded by the evidence that these people are part of a, a culture that is designed to uh, not look critically at its own discourse. Uh, and so Christians can see that of Islam. They can point out the errors of things. 